What I thought we'd do first is we'd each introduce ourselves so you get some idea of who we are. Now, I get to speak first because I was in earliest. I was in Sierra Leone, and my wife hates me to talk about these years because it makes me seem older uh, than I really am. But I, I, I walked out of college in 1963 in June, and two weeks later I, I went to Cornell and trained for 10 weeks for uh, a teaching position in Sierra Leone. In fact, there's a, another colleague here who, who will stand up in a minute when we in, invite the groups to stand up, uh, who was also in Sierra Leone during that time. So I spent two years teaching in Sierra Leone from 63 to 65. And then what I've done since then, I was a newspaper reporter. And for the last many years, uh, with my wife, Cynthia, I've been a documentary filmmaker. And in fact, I am now doing a documentary uh, about the Peace Corps experience which is why one of the cameras here uh, with uh, my daughter, Fania, and uh, director of photography, Mark Rutledge, is, is filming some of this. So that's briefly my background, and then I'll pass, pass along to some of the younger members of the panel. <laughs> Thank you. I'm honored. <laughs> no one's called me young in a while. <laughs> my name is Sharon Shigarik. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Gambia, 1971 to 73. And like Alan, I graduated on May the 22nd. And on June the 18th, I got on an airplane and headed to DC. And five days later, headed to the Gambia. Our program was actually the first in-country training program for the Gambia. Prior to that, everyone had trained in the United States. So we were an experiment in in-country training. And it was a terrific experience. Um, then I spent my career, when I came back from Peace Corps, working for Fortune 500 companies doing international marketing and business development that allowed me to travel all over the world and see some wonderful places and do some wonderful things and meet some fascinating people. And I've touched or been on six of the seven continents. We didn't do business in Antarctica, so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very, very fortunate at the end of my career to come back to Peace Corps. In 2002, I left the corporate world, came back to Peace Corps um, to serve as the country director for the Peace Corps program in Turkmenistan, which was just reopening after it had been suspended after the 9-11 uh, events. Um, spent a couple of years in Turkmenistan getting that program back up and running and all of that, and then came back to Dallas, which is my home, to uh, manage the Peace Corps recruiting office here in Dallas until December the 17th when I retired. And to the next young, lovely lady on my right. Kasalilia Mainko, Niwayo Karkarak, Ipachuan Sange, Eta Rodney Davis Gilbert. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Rodney Davis Gilbert. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in 1983. I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin, Book of Horns, to all of those out there. Mm -hmm. And immediately after, May 15th, I graduated um, and flew to Hawaii, and from Hawaii, um, went 10,000 miles into Micronesia, which is small islands. And once there, I was trained to teach English as a second language. I studied business, so management, both people and the buildings. But I transferred that knowledge to my Peace Corps experience. Um, once I completed my tour of duty there, my service, I returned home and to Dallas, Texas, and I became a Peace Corps recruiter. And during that time period, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and to observe those who were going to be sent off to where the wall had come down. And so Sharon was one of our recruits out of the office at that time. After my time as a recruiter sending over 300 people to various countries in the, in the world, I became the director of Literacy Volunteers of America Dallas, a nonprofit organization that was um, funded through the Dallas Public Library system. Then I met my wonderful husband, and we gave birth to three children, one of which is sitting in the audience, and I began to teach my own children. And from there, um, I went back into, I went into the school system, Dallas Independent School District, and I'm currently a teacher at George Bannerman Dealey Montessori Academy. And that is, brings me here today, so thank you. Paula? I'm Paula Selzer. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic from 1990 to 1992. 
And I did not go into Peace Corps directly from college. Um, I was involved with a program at Rutgers University that had a, a, a partnership with Peace Corps. So I did a year of coursework in public policy with an emphasis in international development and then did two years of Peace Corps service. Um, I was a community development worker in Peace Corps and I was um, in a small community that was a suburb of the second largest city in the Dominican Republic, um, Santiago, and I was in a little town called Canca La Piedra. And um, after two years I came back and um, was hired by the Environmental Protection Agency. I spent 13 years in Washington working in several different programs and about five years ago I moved back to Dallas and continue to work for the Environmental Protection Agency as um, the Children's Environmental Health Coordinator for a five-state region. Привет, меня зовут Jonathan Braddock. Uh, hello, my name is Jonathan Braddock. Uh, I live in uh, Ukraine with my fiance, uh, um, who is here in the audience. Uh, I grew up in Plano uh, with my mother and my sister. Uh, I went. To, I graduated from Plano East uh, Senior High School. I went to college at uh, down in Sam Houston State, where I played um, um, collegiate foot excuse me collegiate football, and uh, had a um, graduated as a, a business um, business uh, management and marketing major. Uh, from there, I did uh, uh, apply uh, my my final semester and was accepted into uh, the Peace Corps uh, and left in uh, early 2001 uh, to Ukraine where I spent um, the following uh, year and a half uh, working at a economic institute as a, as a teacher. I, 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 I had an uh, English club and I also um, uh, uh, taught business communications and business English, um, mainly to help, help the students who did speak English uh, how to get jobs um, uh, using their language. Um, from then, uh, after I returned, I worked for the North Texas Food Bank for six and a half years, and and now I work for uh, the Texas Association for Home Care and Hospice um, in in Austin. Um, I telecommute, live here, um, and work here in, in Dallas. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I'd be remiss if I didn't do something that the others have done. It begins like this: Kushebo, Audi Godigo, Nisef, Awel. Does anyone know the translation for that? There's only one person in this room who, who would know that. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to invite a colleague of mine to stand up before we ask others to stand. Uh, is there anyone else here from, who served in Sierra Leone from 1963 to 65? I guess that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Misefa well. <laughs> uh, she was asking how my body is, but, I mean, <laughs> but, but she's happily married and so am I. So I mean, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is ask those volunteers who served in Africa and the Middle East to please stand. Okay. Right. Oh, hello. Asia and the Pacific Island. Cynthia, you, you didn't serve. <laughs> oh, someone in the back. Okay. Central and South America and the Caribbean. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. And then Europe, East, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Oh. <laughs> And, and finally, with this line of questioning, uh, is there anyone among you who has applied to serve in the Peace Corps? Would you, would you please stand if there's anybody here? Oh. Oh. Right. <laughs> good, good luck. Okay. Before I ask some specific questions of the panelists, and then at some point invite all of you to ask questions, I'm going to ask Sharon to give you a little brief history of the Peace Corps. 
Well, Alan's given me quite a challenge. He said, summarize 50 years of the Peace Corps mm. in five minutes. Four minutes. Oh, four. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble. Okay. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a background. The Peace Corps was, is an independent federal agency that was established by uh, President John F. Kennedy on March 1st, 1961, with the purpose of promoting world peace and friendship. The Peace Corps has three uh, goals to support this mission. They are first, to provide trained men and women to countries that request this assistance. The second goal is to promote an understanding of Americans on the part of people in the countries where Peace Corps volunteers serve. And the third goal is to promote an understanding of the people in the countries where Peace Corps serves to Americans, to help Americans understand other people and other cultures. So these are the three goals of Peace Corps. They've been the goals throughout the entire period, and they remain as relevant today as they were when the agency was formulated in 1961. Over the last 50 years, over 200,000 Americans have served in the Peace Corps in 139 countries. Today, 8,000 600 volunteers serve around the world in 77 countries. Um, about 40% of the volunteers are serving in Africa and the Middle East. About 30% serve in Latin America, Central America, and the Caribbean. About 20% serve in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and about 10% serve in Asian countries in Asia and in um, the Pacific Islands. So it was interesting to see a few Africa volunteers and lots of Latin America volunteers, because normally you see yeah. a lot of Africa volunteers. Um, an interesting tidbit about the Peace Corps is that today, about 60% of the volunteers are female, 40% are male. But if you go back and read about the formulation of the Peace Corps, uh, there was a great debate among Sergeant Shriver, who was tasked with putting together the policies and activities of the Peace Corps and the implementation of the agency. There was great debate about whether women could serve in Peace Corps. Mm. Um, and so happily for those of us in this room who are female and got to serve, uh, they came to their senses and realized that women were just as capable of serving in Peace Corps as men were. Um, but it was very interesting to me that when I started reading into the history that that was an item of great debate. Uh, it was sort of a reflection of the culture in 1960 versus the culture of uh, today. Um, about 19% of the currently serving volunteers identify themselves as being members of minority groups. And diversity in Peace Corps has always been a, a focus because the goal of Peace Corps is to provide the face of America to the world. Um, most Peace Corps volunteers are single. About 7% of the volunteers are married, and Peace Corps does take married couples. When I was a volunteer, and some of other people who served during my era, uh, Peace Corps actually took married couples with children. But we, we, Peace Corps does not do that now. They have kind of discovered the challenges of providing the level of support and educational support for children. So um, they, they do encourage married couples but no kids. So if, if you're uh, married and have kids, wait until they're all grown up, and then y'all can all go into Peace Corps. Um, the other, the currently, the average age of a Peace Corps volunteer is 28, and the oldest serving volunteer, if my memory serves me well, is 82. So those of you out there that were ch the, the children of Kennedy and the coming de the next decades who said, oh, gee, I wish I'd really done that, it's never too late. Uh, and older volunteers tend to bring life experience that is very valued in Peace Corps. So um, just keep that in mind as you look at retirement and other life choices. Um, about 90% of the currently serving volunteers have at least an undergraduate education, and um, so we're a highly educated group of folks. And one of the questions, and we've kind of heard a little bit about it when the panel talked, is what do Peace Corps volunteers do? Um, Peace Corps works in four major areas today. Um, the biggest one, of course, is education. Historically, it's always been the biggest uh, thing that people have done. Alan was a teacher. I was a teacher. Uh, most everybody here on this panel was either a teacher in a formal or an informal program. 
but about 40% of the volunteers today work in formal education programs in schools of some sort. They're teaching math, science, English, special ed at all levels from primary, secondary to uh, university. About 30% um, of the volunteers work in uh, health, HIV, AIDS education, and youth development. Uh, these programs are really focused on working with members of the community and uh, healthcare professionals to improve their level of knowledge on everything from basic hygiene and nutrition to HIV AIDS prevention. Um, let's see, the, fourth, the third program is Ag and Environment, Agriculture and Environment. When you think of Peace Corps, the early days there was a lot of agricultural work. Today it's not quite as much and there's a bigger emphasis on environmental education, everything from recycling programs and garbage management to, to reforestation and, uh, and still some of your basic agriculture. Then the fourth area is the area that Jonathan mentioned that's somewhat newer to Peace Corps, and that is the business and IT area. Now, historically, volunteers may work, have worked with entrepreneurs or agricultural co-ops. Um, today, they, they teach in business schools, they work in co-ops, they work with municipal governments to support uh, business development. So um, I think the message is that Peace Corps volunteers do a lot of different kinds of things and the focus is really on helping the host country uh, to, to resolve and work on the issues and problems that are most important to them. Thank you. Okay, Here, here's how it began for me. <clears throat> Dear Frank, Frank was a, a really close friend of mine. It was winter of 1962-63. Dear Frank, I was eating lunch today at the fraternity house and got an unexpected call from my father. Boy, was he upset. I mean, I, did, I didn't use that term then, but I didn't think I should probably use the term. Uh, he got a letter from the Peace Corps in Washington asking him to answer some questions about me. Well, you would have thought I was planning on defecting to Russia. <laughs> he told me he'd been reading terrible things in the newspaper about the Peace Corps, that it was a safe haven for draft dodgers, beatniks, homosexuals, and general misfits. He reminded me that he and my mother had not sent me to Williams College so I could go off to some cockamamie country in the middle of nowhere. That, that was, uh, I say, 1962, 1963. Uh, I love my father, I love my mother, and I, I went anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, any, anybody else have a, an excerpt from you know, something that they'd like to read? I, I actually found a page in my journal that I would tell Dallin I would actually be willing to share because it reflected a typical day um, of my life in the Gambia. I was a science teacher, I lived up country in a little village, and my secondary project was uh, that I coached a girls basketball team and in 1972 girls having a basketball team in the Gambia was just truly unheard of and we arranged for a tournament up 200 miles up river to for the girls to go up and play and and the boys too to have this sports day up there so this is an excerpt from my journal March the 20th 1973 well we went to Georgetown the lorry came at 11.30 on Friday. We finally got to Georgetown after 10 p.m. with many breakdowns on the way. We did well in sports. The girls won a trophy, and we came out second overall. So we did, so we did fine. Many of the kids came home with awards, and we finally came back yesterday on Monday because we couldn't get a lorry on Sunday at all. I was glad to get home and it was good to visit with the RPCV in the area. Today, the kids discovered, oh no, the kids discovered yesterday that I have a cobra living in my backyard. <laughs> Hope we can kill it, it's a, it's a big one, five or six feet long. Well, I gotta get to work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why did you join? One of you should respond, except for Sharon, who will wait a couple of minutes. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do after college. And, <laughs> uh, actually, I, I have a story about that. I, I went to an interview uh, my final s semester uh, to Palestine, Texas. And this is nothing against Palestine. This is nothing against the, the place I went to. I, I was interviewing for Walmart. 
and I had a great interview. You know, things were going looking good, and I was on, was driving on the way home, and I just uh, I just felt bad. I, I didn't feel right. It didn't seem like something that I wanted to do, and even though uh, everybody said, "Hey, you know, you should, you know, make sure you get the job." my mother or my father, you know, get a job at the college. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't the feeling I had. And uh, I was sitting, um, move forward a little bit, I was sitting uh, with a friend of mine at Denny's and we were talking, oh, what should I do, what should I do? Well, AmeriCorps came up. Oh, AmeriCorps sounds great. I love this country, but you know, I've never been outside of this country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we mentioned, she mentioned the Peace Corps. And I said, oh, yes. Peace Corps. I didn't know anything about it really, but I knew kind of of it and what it curtailed. And from then on, it was that's all I could focus on. Peace Corps. Jonathan actually progged my thoughts because my experience was pretty, I call it serendipity. Um, it was nearing the end of my senior year in college at UT, and I decided that hmm, I didn't think I wanted to follow the path that everyone else was going. Um, at, in the School of Business at UT, you're very much encouraged to go through the interviewing process. And before I finished an exam and I went home, and I'm looking at my aunt who's sitting in the audience. She's going to be a part of my story, beginning and ending. And, okay, and I just, in the middle of the night, drove home because I just had this feeling. And um, I sat with my mom, and then she invited me before I returned to go with her. She was going to serve at the church. It was uh, Sunshine Committee night or something. And I was the youngest person there in the back of the room. And in walked a woman. And Peace Corps was already on my mind and my thoughts. I saw a commercial while I was with my mom. So it was on my mind. And then in walked a woman. I don't know her name. And everyone went, oh, she's here. And we ended up sitting next to each other for the dinner. And she said, I'm a return. I said, there's something about you. She said, I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer. And I thought, ah. It just kept happening over and over again. And then when I went through the rigorous interview process, just for the fun of it, because I'd already decided I was going to go into the Peace Corps, I began the process. I was interviewing with IBM and Procter and & Gamble. And I believe it was Procter & Gamble who decided that they really wanted me. And so it's a step by step. You take a test, then after you pass the test, they whittle it down to a few people. So they sent in their corporate person to interview me. And he finally, uh, during our interview, he sat back and he said, obviously, you're not interested in taking this job. <laughs> I mean, you have such a comfort about, you know, you're not stressed about this process or anything. He said, what are you planning to do? And I said, well, I've decided I would like to be a return Peace Corps volunteer because I want to see um, what I can do with my God-given talents to serve someone else. Um, before I go out and just become a part of the regular grind of things. And he said, um, when you get back, just let me know. I'll have something waiting for you. And that began my moment of understanding that Peace Corps is it's, it's invaluable. It's worth so much more than, than one can imagine. And it opens doors. And it's greatly respected. So that was my yeah, good. beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, after college, I was sort of bouncing around from job to job. I'm sure none of you have ever had that experience <laughs> before. I was sort of, you know, what do I do next? I, I worked for a nonprofit for a couple of years. Um, I went back to graduate school and studied art history. And um, one night, I was at a gathering and met someone who said they were in the Peace Corps. And just like you guys, kind of a light bulb went off. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. Um, I had grown up in Dallas and went to the, the same church with all my friends, of course, the same high school with all my buddies. Um, even though, you know, we lived in one of the largest cities in the country, I had a very, very limited um, scope of friends and experiences. And I just thought, I, I, I want to go see the world. I want to experience a different culture. I really would like to understand the United States from a different perspective. Um, so, yeah, when she said Peace Corps, I thought, that's, that's for me. <laughs> well, the person who said Peace Corps to me was President Kennedy. Wow. I was, I'm actually old enough to remember <laughs> <laughs> talking about it. <laughs> yeah, that old. No, I was about 10 or 11 when all of the discussion about Peace Corps was going on. And actually, when Peace Corps was established, I was 12. 
And, um, but I remember all the discussions and all the news clips and the people going to the White House and shaking the President's hand and all this mm -hmm. um, talk about going overseas and helping other people. And man, that just, mm -hmm. I'm, at 11, I said, that is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I want wow. to do this. Yes. And so it got buried in the back of my brain somewhere mm -hmm. that, and, and I got to my senior year in college and went, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted to do, you know? So I came down to the Dallas recruiting office. There was one here back then and talked to him and filled out the forms. And um, you have to write these essays when you apply for Peace Corps about why you want to be in Peace Corps. And I thought, you know, I could write I want to save the world and do good and all that kind of stuff because I did. But the other part of... Peace Corps is the going abroad, the learning about another culture, meeting other people, getting that global exposure. And so when I wrote my essays, I really was honest and said, this is what I expect to get out of the deal, too, in addition to what I expect to bring to the table. And I thought, oh, man, they'll never take me. But happily, they did. And I got to be a teacher, um, a science teacher in a very, very poor country where the kids did not have a lot of access to information. So I was able to teach them not only about science, but about nutrition and health and all that. So, I mean, it was that that was the motivation to share what I had with other people. Yeah, and, and for me, I mean, similar to so many of you and those of you who joined the Peace Corps, it was a mix of John Kennedy. And I was in college when 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 Kennedy was elected and and was president. Uh, it was a mix of what he was saying, you know, that what you all hear time and time again, it's not, you know, what you can do, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Mm -hmm. And that, that resonated to me as a young adult. And it, it was a mix of that and, and the kind of incurable romantic in me, the idea of going off, you know, to foreign lands and experiencing this, not just traveling, you know, mm -hmm. th through Europe, but somehow going off and being able to kind of to, to serve, to do something that I thought would be meaningful was, was what, what motivated me. I don't know whether, you, did you train in country or? I was the first group to train yeah. in country, yeah. Well, Gay and I trained, you know, Gay is my colleague from Sierra Leone, trained at Cornell uh, in, in, in 63. But for many of you, I mean, what, what was it like to be one day you're, you're in, getting ready to take a plane from Washington, D.C., or from, from New York, and then 24 hours later or less, you're in a completely, you know, envi an environment so very different mm -hmm. from what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. Aside from arriving in Sierra Leone and getting off the plane and this, you know, heat, you know, this tropical heat just hit us in the face, I thought, uh-oh, you know, Am I going to be able to to, to last? But no. But, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's talk a little bit about that. What it was like to, to suddenly be in a place very, very different from from what you were used to. I, I can vividly remember when, when I first got off the plane, um, and we took a bus from the airport into where we were going to do our our staging, and um, the amazing amount of trash in the Dominican Republic. I mean, as you take the bus from, from the airport, um, just both sides of the highway, plastic bottles, huge cartons, just amazing amount of trash. And I, you know, I was thinking to myself, these people have a serious solid waste issue here. It's probably at that moment that I thought, I've got to go work for the Environmental Protection Agency. I, I can't be spending two years here in the Dominican Republic. I've got to go back. But uh, it, it was um, it was it was quite an adjustment. Um, not only was there a lot of trash um, in the highways, but people would ride in public transportation and then they'd eat their their chicken and then they'd roll down the window and throw the trash out the window <gasps> you know and we were all just horrified that, that they would do that um, and then from there we went to um, our training and stayed for three months with a family and living with a family was quite an adjustment um, I, I'm an only child and um, we had a three-bedroom house and right here in the heart of Dallas and suddenly I was in a barrio that had you know, no grass, dirt roads that would flood, and so you'd be walking through the muck and the mud to go to training. 
um, lived with a family that had four kids, a couple of dogs, a few cats, and other assorted little furry critters that would <laughs> run around in the house, chickens. Um, so that was quite an adjustment for me to, to come from Dallas and go into that sort of environment. And I, I, it all just fl flooded back when you started talking mm -hmm. about it. Uh, my experience was essentially just a, a, a thousand images and smells and textures and everything hitting you within a, like a, a uh, I guess about a 35 to 40 hour period considering that. I, 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 had, I flew up to Chicago, we spent the night in Chicago and then we flew out to uh, Frankfurt and then I, uh, from Frankfurt to Kiev and then we arrived in, in, in at night. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see anything really. We went from the airport to the bus mm -hmm. and then we drove another two and a half hours from, from the airport. And, um, so and that, that, that's really where I picked that, this, this whole imagery up in my head. I remember um, I was very nervous because that night we were to meet our host families mm -hmm. um, and I had been, uh, the Peace Corps sends you tapes uh, be, well, it, when I uh, was in, the, they would send you uh, a tape of uh, the language you were going to be in. So I received a couple of Ukrainian tapes, and so I was I would I put them on before I go to bed, and uh, and I listen to them, and uh, you know learn some of the language. I had no idea what I was saying because you know <laughs> you don't really know until you hear someone who actually speaks the language how to pronounce things. And I can remember going, uh, the one I always I wanted to make sure I, I said was, I'm, I'm pleased to meet you. And um, uh, in Russian, it's Rad Vas Vidit, but I had to say it in Ukrainian. I didn't know the Russian, at, at the time I would be switching to Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So I was over and over in my head of the bus, I mean, in the, in the roads, my gosh, the roads were bumpy. The bus uh, was, we had a, a decent bus, but... The whole imagery of that, and just, uh, and then we, and then we arrived at the train center. And when we walked in, there was a group like this, and they were all standing up, and they were all, all, all of our families, and they were all dressed in, with the uh, shapkas, which are the, the big, the big hats, and you know, it was cold winter, um, and just I can see it in my head. It was just unbelievable. I thought, wow, I'm actually going to be living here. <laughs> And my host father or family is out in the, I, I remember I was like looking, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Mm -hmm. And then when I remember I walked up to him, you know, he, he's a wonderful man, you know, he, but just very soft spoken, you know, nice to meet you. I, I got it out. I got it out. And he said, okay, you know, and he grabbed my bags and we went. And then he, I don't even remember him replying to me, actually. I think we just got in, the, in, in a, a taxi and went home. And the whole the taxi ride was pretty much you know silent because he didn't speak any any uh, any well he he knew a couple words because they had had Peace Corps volunteers there, so it, it was it was just that that imagery was amazing. I think the first term that comes to mind is an assault on all the senses. Um, but if I start from the beginning again, I go back to my aunt Barbara Record. I remember uh, she and my mother drove me in the middle of the night to DFW Airport because we had to be there very early for the flight. And um, I remember that it dawned on me that they thought they'd never see me again in their lives. Because okay. Okay. <laughs> they had this look on their face, you know? Okay. <laughs> and I thought I was going on the adventure of a lifetime, and I, you know, I had no concept of the time span and what it meant to them. So as I looked at them, I thought, oh, because someone asked me, I think my mom said, what is it that you want? Is there anything you want? And I thought, chocolate cake and milk. Because that's two things that I love, and I don't know that they're going to have it. And so, okay. <laughs> and so off my aunt went running to get the chocolate cake and the milk, and she found it that early at DFW Airport. And I sat and talked with my mom. And actually, it was time for me to get on the plane. So they almost missed, she almost missed me. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I got it, and that was my last time eating chocolate cake and milk for a long time. And then um, we landed in, well, we hopped from California and into Hawaii, so it was through the night. And all 60 of us from all over the United States uh, came together um, for the first time. And that was a wonderful experience, because you don't often get a chance to experience the different cultures that we have here, at least during my time, um, in the United States. So we were all 60 together for pre-service, if you will, to 
do the things, the technical things, like get your shots and sign your paperwork. And we had a little, a fun time. So then we got on the plane, uh, probably after about a week, and we called it, I, my pictures would say, Party in the Sky, because we were just, the plane was our plane. It's the only plane that goes there. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so it was our plane. And I, I won't forget, we stopped, we had to stop on a little island, and you could throw a rock to one side, or you could throw the rock to the other side. And I took a picture, and I remember them saying, after I had taken the picture, no pictures allowed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it was actually one of the um, islands where our military and warfare is produced there, and so there were tanks pointing at the plane. So, of course, you, I'm thinking, where am I going, right? Um, so that's why I took the picture, because of the tanks. And then we, plane, we hopped a few more islands, and we, we landed in the night in, on the island of Ponape, and the 60 of us were to disperse into the Micronesian islands. We all trained together first uh, for half of that summer, the three-month period, um, where we did cultural training. So we, we did get selected from for host families, and we called it the raffling, the drawing, you know, the raffling drawing, because we, we, we literally stood in the middle, and then um, a family would come forward, and my family came forward. I had a little mama, and she put this maramar on my head, and she anointed me with oil, and she brought me over. And of course, if you know me, um, from Dallas, Texas, then you know that I carry a lot of luggage. So, okay. <laughs> I think 80 pounds was the limit, right? In okay. Hawaii. And fortunately, there were a lot of people who carried a little luggage. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and so they just put it all together and all my luggage went with me. And then, of course, it was gifts and things I was able to share with others once I was there. And I won't forget that I had a few cassettes. We didn't get cassettes to listen to language. We had, so that, told, that dates me. We had, um, we did have, a, okay, that's true. We had um, information ahead of time of things that we should practice doing. And one of them was to take off our watch and to, you know, to not mark time because time does not function in the same way that it does here. And so, um, as you see, I, to this day, I no longer wear a watch. Um, and you're in touch with your inner sense of time because you would rise with the sun and you would fall with the sun. Um, we were also encouraged, this will get a laugh out of you, to practice in a private area going topless because I was on an island where the women went topless. Okay, okay. And so, and so, so if that gives you any idea of the kinds of things that, I, that we had to adjust to. Um, for food, of course, it, it was in the Pacific. Um, I, oh, by the way, when we were flying, it was the first time in my life that I had lived the same day twice um, because I passed the international dateline. So we lived the same day twice. And then um, we got there. We were with our host families. Then we, we would meet together for language classes. Then we went. We were decided on where we were going to go. And I think Paula was talking about she once was going to go to Yap. Well, Ponape became the island that I would remain on, and others were going to go to the other islands. So then we separated from one another, and we had our training for teaching. And I'm dragging this out because at that time, we went away from each other. And though this island was 60 miles in radius, <laughs> it seemed like it was that we would never see each other again. All of a sudden, you get further and further away from people. Um, but when we finally came to town to meet up with each other, we were very different in the time. Um, we sat in a place, because uh, we, we were very remote, and we came, we met in town, and there was a table, and I remember we stared at the trail of ants, and we were observing the ants. Now, if you were in America, what would we do? Okay. <laughs> we would complain, we'd spray, we'd do it. Okay. And we just observed the ants, and we knew then that we were different. Oh, gosh, thinking about arriving in the Gambia. Um, we flew from New York, I think it was, direct into Dakar. And we were the first training group that was going to be trained in country. And we arrived at about 5 or 6 in the morning. The sun was just coming up as we left the airport. Um, but my first vision is the Dakar airport. If you've never been there, it was a roaring riot at 5 o'clock in the morning. And the, the country director was this guy named Lloyd Kepferly, whom I'd never met, but short guy, kind of round, standing up on a something going, don't let them take your luggage, because there were all these porters <laughs> running around trying to grab your luggage so that they could earn money carting yes. your luggage. So that's my first vision of, of, 
uh, of Africa is don't let them take your luggage. So you're, you're kind of going, where's my luggage, where's my luggage? And so they rounded us all up, put us on a bus to drive us to the Gambia, which was a couple hour drive. Um, and we stopped. As we pulled out of the airport, the sun is coming up. You're looking across the salt flats. Um, and this parade of camels goes by. And this is after you've been hit in the face with the humidity and the smell of Africa. Africa has a very distinctive smell. And, and you see these camels walking in the distance. And my thought was, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, I'm really here. I really did it. We're really going to do this. Yeah. And that was a recurring thought. I think every Peace Corps volunteer yeah. can identify with that you have that more than once during your service. <laughs> A couple things for me. It's, it, it won't be the first day I was there, but uh, I was teaching school at, at a, in a town, a small town, uh, about a hundred miles from the capital city of Freetown, which is where we flew into. And uh, I moved in with a, a, another Peace Corps volunteer who had been there for, for a year. And we had a dinner that evening of, of rice, and but we started with martinis. Uh, he, he, had, he had been there a year, and uh, I should explain that Peace Corps volunteers back then did drink. I, I don't know whether they do today. Not one once. No, that was no. oh, yeah, no. generational. Really, really, really. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there I was. I had a couple martinis. I actually had a little bit more. It's the first time I'd ever had a martini, and I had way too many. The rice was the hottest food I had ever had in my entire life. Mm -hmm. So I was in, in a position where I was either going to pass out <laughs> or I was going to throw up. <laughs> and I, 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 frankly, I don't remember. I mean, I'd like to say I do. But that was a, a first kind of impression, mm -hmm. the, the, the food that I was going to be eating. Because for the next year, I, I ate rice six out of seven uh, nights a week, okay. and I, I, I still like rice to, to this day. Yes. That, that's one thing. Another thing that happened soon after, I was a teacher, uh, and I was te one of the things I was teaching was tropical Africa in world history. So it came to a point early on when uh, we were talking about you know, Western religions. Mm. So I was asking, I, I taught in a school that went from the seventh grade to what would be the, the 12th grade. And I remember vividly, uh, I would ask the, the students about, you know, okay, tell me a little bit of, of, about Islam. And they would, many of them were, were, were Muslim, and they talked about Islam. I asked them about Christianity, and they, many of them were Christians, and they talked about Christianity. Uh, I need to preface this next comment. I'm Jewish. I said, well, who knows anything about Judaism and the Hebrews? And I remember David Fofana, a, a big guy, about maybe six feet burly, got up in the back of the class. David must have been about 15 or 16. And he said, well, yeah, they were the ones who killed Christ. So there I am, you know, <laughs> Jew Jewish, two months into my, you know, uh, Peace Corps service, having to kind of explain, you know, well, you know, that's not exactly true. So we spent the next couple weeks on a comparative religion. So that, that, that was one of those first experiences. Uh, where, where we are now is at a point where I'd like to invite questions or comments from the floor. Uh, so whoever has a question, please go up to the microphone because it is being recorded and we need you to kind of step up to the microphone. I, I know this person. She's a close friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so how is your sex life now? <laughs> Don't put that on the table. What I'd like to ask, because as I think about the aspirations of how this program began and 50 years down the road, um, what, uh, and you know, all of you can answer, or just a few, the single most important thing that you think the Peace Corps accomplished. Mm -hmm. And the second part of that would be the single most important thing that it may have failed to do as it set out in its goals. 
I'd like to take Paula. that. Um, for me, I, I don't know if, if you can say the single most important thing that it accomplished as an organization. Um, I don't know that I would address it that way, but I would say I think that um, one of the, the most important things that um, volunteers have been able to accomplish as they come back is, um, is positions of leadership in their community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, before I went into Peace Corps, I, I didn't, didn't really have much, much of a sense of what a leader should be or what a leader is. But after spending a couple of years doing community assessments, um, serving other people, um, I, I chose a career in, in public service, which would never have occurred to me otherwise. And if you go to the Peace Corps website, it says things about notable volunteers and how they're senators and congressmen and writers and professors and teachers. And um, it, it has notable volunteers, but it doesn't talk about the people who aren't necessarily notable um, mm. with worldwide recognition or, or recognition within their community, but are, are recognized you know, by their peers or by the people that they serve now, um, because I, I think that we do bring back a sense of volunteerism and service, and I think that's probably one of the biggest things that Peace Corps has done for this country is, is put that level of volunteerism back into the communities in this country. I would say the second uh, big contribution that, that individual volunteers have made and that Peace Corps as an organization has made is uh, enhancing the understanding of who Americans are and what we're like among a lot of people all over the world. Uh, if you're the only American in a town or a village or whatever, everybody knows you. Everybody knows what you do. They know how you do it, when you do it, where you do it. And um, they form an opinion about Americans based on the, those one or two people that they meet. So even though volunteers may not recognize how broadly they have impacted people's opinions about America, um, they have had a very, very significant impact on uh, countering some of those images that they, that are broadcast on Santa Barbara and whatever the soap opera of the country is, that, that that's how they form their picture of America. So I think that's a very, also a very important contribution to the United States and to our image abroad as uh, real people who genuinely care about others. Yeah. Alan, if I may. Please. Somewhere it is written that um, America provides the opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And for me, as an African-American female that was born in 1965 at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas, into the West Dallas Projects, who would have thought that I would have come from a street named Fish Trap, going to the elementary school named Amelia Earhart, land on an island where it's believed that her plane crashed and she was never found. So Peace Corps accomplished giving each of its citizens an opportunity of a lifetime um, to share with others and to bring back home and to encourage others to do the same. How has it failed? That's a difficult question for me, but I think Paula's statement I could concur with because there are thousands of Peace Corps volunteers who have touched many lives. And I think it's probably appropriate at this time to mention a gentleman, if he would stand, his name is Willie, I met him here today as we were getting started, and Willie told me that he was from Libya? Liberia, Liberia sorry. Li of course I should know that. Liberia, okay. <laughs> Liberia. And what he stated to me is very common for many Peace Corps volunteers. He said in 1974, a Peace Corps volunteer came to his village, and he was a houseboy there for, for him as he lived there. And after uh, that experience, his Peace Corps volunteer completed his service in two years and returned to the United States. And then in 1986, I believe, approximately 10 years later, he welcomed Willie to the United States and assisted him in attaining his education. Um, and so there, he, he roomed and boarded with him there. And then they have maintained a relationship that goes beyond anything. And I think Peace Corps has allowed us to be a global community and so uh, we appreciate your presence, Willie, because you are evidence of the things that we hope we did. We touched the lives of many others. Thanks mm -hmm. very much, and I think this is a very good event. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I came to know about this event when I read the paper, the other paper this, uh, last week, and I saw this gentleman 
named uh, uh, Mark Flick from the, this North Texas, mm -hmm. now serving in Namibia mm -hmm. with a group of uh, young uh, Namibian yeah. students. Mm -hmm. He's yeah, touching lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Failure, I will not even uh, dwell on failure of the Peace Corps. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no failure to my eyes yet. Mm -hmm. America, as my sister mentioned, mm -hmm. continues to portray her face to the world. The beacon of hope for many. So, I standing here, a product of this uh, topic, you talk about in Sierra Leone. Actually, I was I met this peace corps fellow in Sierra Leone at my secondary school, mm -hmm. 74. And right now, of course, the peace corps fellow has retired. He's, he's in uh, Dayton, Ohio. That's where I, do, I I live all my academic days before I transfer here to Texas to uh, teach with Dallas County Community College. So yes, indeed, like me, there are many stories within Dallas here and beyond. So yes, the peace corps has accomplished mm -hmm. many, and there's more to come. So I was very happy when Mr. Obama has renewed the call for more services and uh, hopefully there will be more funding to encourage many more Americans to become just what Kennedy called before. So, uh, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And Thank that's you. what we are all here. Thank you. So, um, I became a U.S. citizen uh, last December. Congratulations. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and I'm thinking about what can I do for this country. Mm. And right now I am <laughs> teaching with the Dallas County <laughs> Community College at North Lake College in Irving, touching the lives of uh, your children mm -hmm. and, of course, my children. Mm -hmm. So hopefully mm -hmm. life will be much different mm -hmm. when many of us get involved mm -hmm. in this call to service. I thank you, and this is a very good event. Let's work together. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, would you step up to the microphone, please? Yeah. Um, the lady in the middle, I didn't catch your name. Oh. oh. It's a girl with a guy's name. It's Rodney. Hey, Rodney. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hey, Rodney. Okay. Um, I, I get... Um, we're segregated or prejudiced when we go to other countries, like we become the minority. Mm -hmm. But some things you just said mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, resonated with me is I realized I was told very matter-of-factly by my, my group of Peace Corps volunteers, there were 46 of us in Slovakia, mm -hmm. and they told me, um, Christine, most people that go to Peace Corps are of affluent families. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Okay. <laughs> and all of a sudden I realized there was discrimination among our group. I wanted to know if any of you experienced that, whether by socioeconomically or anything like that, among your own Peace Corps volunteers. Very good question. What was your name? I'm sorry. Chris, Christy Ecton. Okay. Hi, Christy. Christy. Hi, Christy. Thank you for your question. I don't know that I personally thought it was discrimination. I just thought it was um, the norm. Because when you're raised here in America, it was the norm for me that um, I would be in the minority. What was unique, as you stated, was that all 60 now were in the minority. Okay? <laughs> okay? And so for the first time, my counterparts, my fellow Americans, experienced a bit of what I experienced all my life. So it made my experience very freeing um, and very easy in, in ways that it might have been difficult for them. So out of 60, um, there were two of us that were African Americans. Sharon. I have a lot of Sharons around here. Sharon uh, was from Atlanta, Georgia, and her father is the minister of the minister of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's church. So if that her affluence is she's affluent. Okay. <laughs> I'm a rarity in the Peace Corps. At least I thought I was of my 60. I didn't think of it that way because I was raised as most of us have been uh, during my years that you are always rich, you're rich in spirit. It's by what you what you do with what you have. And so um, I didn't see it as impoverished. But the people of the culture there did ask me questions. So I think they had thought on things for quite a while. Um, they asked me um, about the children. They saw us as children that were coming to, to their country to assist them in their development until they got to know us and to know what we had to offer. And so, I don't want to take up much time, so I think I should. Have I answered your question? 
Okay. <laughs> may, may I say one? Add one thing before. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a little different take on this, but um, Malam Usman w was a Nigerian trader who maybe twice a year who would come through town carrying on his back a lot of different wares, blankets, uh, carvings, jewelry. Malam Usman would set out his wares on the front porch of, of our house. And the prices that Malam Usman wanted to charge were ex exorbitant. I mean, there was no way that we Peace Corps volunteers could pay, yeah. but because he figured, you know, he was a smart businessman, he figured we were rich, mm -hmm. but we spent probably four or five hours, and no exaggeration, no, maybe three hours, with Malam Usman bargaining back and forth until finally, you know, it wasn't the rich American, it was just this guy who was there, you know, Try, who was also earning a living, but you know, willing to pay X amount of dollars, but who wasn't the rich American? Please. Oh, thank you. I'm really enjoying this program, and I'm really proud of my niece because it's uh, even though that I've never traveled like that, it's though our family has traveled mm -hmm. just to have one in your family mm -hmm. to give the information that she carries daily. Uh, to us, we are we are proud. But my concern, Sharon, you talked about 11 and 12 years old wanting to be a volunteer. And in our country, I, I'm proud of 50 years of Peace Corps. And it's now time that that uh, experience that you, you all have taught us in our country that our children would grow up to want to be volunteers. Because most of a lot of our children want to be paid for for everything, and we're going to have to take some of the things that they're talking about and establish that with our, our own culture in the United States, because we I don't think we treat our own some uh, what you all treated of uh, people that were uh, less fortunate. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I. Uh, was never a uh, Peace Corps volunteer. I think of myself, however, as having had a similar experience before there was a Peace Corps when I was a teacher for a couple of years in Afghanistan and making uh, the honorable sum of uh, close to 2,000 a year. Uh, and uh, it really... Uh, when the Peace Corps idea came up, uh, it appealed to me very much. But I uh, was in the Foreign Service at the time, and I became a staff uh, member. And in the end, I had a total of eight years as a staff member in two different occasions uh, with the Peace Corps uh, in four different countries. But uh, what I wanted to hear emphasize was that the last two that I was in were so different and volunteers were obviously having a very different experience. The next last one that I was in in the early 70s was called Upper Volta. Anybody know what that's called today? Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. yes. Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the poorest countries of the world. Uh, but wonderful people. And the volunteers, the Peace Corps volunteers there, just love being there. And a large proportion of them extended. Some of them extended, you know, six years, eight years, they were there. You know, uh, they just didn't want to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I went to one of the richer countries of the time hmm. uh, as the director again. That was Iran. Now, I love Iran. I had spent, I'd lived already in Iran before that as a foreign service officer. I'd married an Iranian. So, so I was uh, very much at home there. But these were the last years now of the Shah. And the volunteers, uh, 
uh, didn't like the way things were going there. Uh, the Shah was becoming really megalomaniac. And uh, that was part of it. But there was a movement against him growing up, and that many Iranians applied to these other Americans who came in, these Peace Corps volunteers. And it seems that the Iranians thought, well, uh, the Americans are here to make money. What are these? These must be the after the outcasts because they're not making any money. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> And what are they doing here? Yeah. Maybe sure. they're spies or whatever. So, and, and the, the end run, is, the end result was, uh, it was decided, and I had a role in deciding this, that we had to leave Afghanistan, and I mean uh, uh, Iran. And I think it's a good thing we did. Was just before the revolution, we got out. Mm -hmm. So there was a very different uh, experience. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to have to wind this up. Uh, okay, Th this will be, this will be the, last the last question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Could, you all, could each one of you talk about how it was working with a counterpart, your host counterpart? How well did that work for and, you? I mean, yeah. okay. I don't know if you could talk politics, and you mentioned a little bit of religion, but I'm talking about the person you were there to train or work with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're going to have to keep it short, guys. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, make I'll, it I'll just make it real, real brief. It, it was the most challenging thing I possibly could have done in Peace Corps. Uh, um, the, un, un, the understanding of my counterpart um, uh, was different, uh, or for why I was there, was different from why uh, what I thought. Yeah. Uh, and it, it actually led me to actually leave Peace Corps a little early. Uh, he wanted me there as a way to, to kind of give him a pat on the back. Um, it gave the uh, institute that, that I worked at a prestige, and therefore students would go there. Uh, and what the end result was, I didn't get the, the kind of the, the classes and the structure that I was hoping I would get from them. Um, uh, I've made, I, I, I just looked at it as a challenge, and, and I tried my best and did what I could and, and worked around my counterpart, but it was certainly a, a challenge. And I, I had some challenges as well. Um, my counterpart was the director of the local uh, school district, and he had been put in place in that position by Trujillo and had been in that position for about 30 years. And there was a trust issue between uh, the community and my counterpart. And so I gave it a try for about a year. And um, hopefully I, I did some good stuff with the local um, school district there by um, bringing in some textbooks and um, and school desks and that type of thing. But the second year, I wound up transferring and worked for a USAID-funded organization that did um, a public awareness about AIDS and worked with local prostitutes. And um, so I worked with that organization, did some grant writing and training, and, and found it much more successful my second year. I, go ahead. Um, briefly, it starts with just the first day the principal gave me the keys to the school, the entire school building, and um, there was a monsoon, a lot of rain, and I think what he wanted me to bring to the school, Madeline, was structure and consistency, irregardless of what goes on, like we do here in the United States. And so though the river was flooding and um, I couldn't bathe in the river, I still just girded up my loins, if you will, and went to the school and opened the building for those who would come. And I had an incredible learning experience from that because I learned that the teacher who lived in the house with me, the reason he didn't come was because you can't see the chalkboard when it's raining and, the, and you've got chicken wire. <laughs> okay. um, so, but I did open the door. And for the children who were standing there shivering um, in very little clothing, we just used our words to have school. I went on, though, later to develop a library which the children chose to name the Davis Library, um, and so got books to come. And I worked with the municipality for the youth development. So I had counterparts in many facets, and we decided collectively as volunteers we would show them how we all work together here in the United States from community to community and connected it all by having a camp for the entire island at the summited at the top of the, the mountain. But we weren't the ones, you know how the saying is, you can take someone to the water to fish or you can teach them to fish. Well, we stepped back 
from our counterparts, if you will. We work side by side, and then they are the ones, the chiefs of the villages and the second chiefs were the ones who ran the entire camp. But we orchestrated based on the experiences that we had here in the United States. And I think it was a very successful experience um, that hopefully the library is continuing and other things as well. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to wind this up. Mm -hmm. Let me say two, two important things that I, I think that we brought back. Uh, I, I can't speak for everybody, but there are 200,000 of us. Mm -hmm. But I think, for one thing, we brought a sensitivity to other cultures uh, that so many Americans didn't have before this whole Peace Corps experience. There was a sensitivity to that. And the other, and maybe the most profound for me, was that one person can really make a difference. Sure. You know, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with an individual, you care about them, you're interested in them, and that you can make a difference in their lives. Okay.